So I'm Dean Triple of Agoric, and we have a smart contract platform where we built a play version of it, and this will talk about that play version. Um, so in 2013, uh, Mark Miller, our chief scientist, uh, released a paper called Distributed Electronic Rights in JavaScript. Um, this is right, right around the time that, you know, a couple months later, um, uh, Ethereum came out. And it had an example contract in there. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of stuff in there where Alice wants to sell something to Bob. They want to go through an exchange, right? So, so uh, in order to do that, and this was to do smart contracts before blockchain, right? So this was to, to do smart contracts between individual machines. So Alice and Bob would find a mutually trusted third party called their contract host. They would have a smart contract to do escrow exchange that they would agree on the contract and deploy it to the contract host. And then they would use that contract host, and there would be the, the, the contract host and then the uh, issuer of the money and the issuer of the stock or a different currency or whatever it is they're exchanging. And they would agree on that contract host to, to have it uh, perform the escrow for them as a mutually trusted third party between them, right? And so this was all working and built in this 2013 uh, system where he did it in a secure subset of JavaScript. So now, come you know, several years later, um, we're looking at how do you be able to reproduce these kinds of smart contracts in the same kind of architecture in the blockchain environment. So we're building a platform, so now, you know, at the time it was just individual machines and we were doing cryptographic protocols between these machines. To us, blockchain looks like an implementation of a new machine built with agreement among parties rather than silicon. So Ethereum was a brand new machine with about the power of an old cell phone, but with vastly higher integrity, vastly higher assurance of correct execution, continuously audited computation that would be able to do the thing that you programmed it to do. So we suddenly got this new realm of machines, whether it's quorum machines like Hyperledger or, or, or other permission networks or the public chains, they're all just machines and so the same architecture of doing electronic commerce in a smart contract between machines could potentially apply both between machines and within and between uh, chains. So we figure, we, 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 so here our architecture starts from this assumption that there is the ecosystem and then on top of that we build an environment where the world is an asynchronous place. We have these islands of synchrony, of, of, of simple sequential programming that are all communicating asynchronously with each other. And in the JavaScript world, right, because we use a secure subset of JavaScript, in the JavaScript world, you know, programmers are used to that. You have a browser with an event loop where a message comes in, you compute a new state, and you, you're done with that event. Um, it, same with Node. Well, smart contracts are the same way. Message comes in. In JavaScript, you have your state described. You compute a new state and some messages going out. And you take a transaction and you're done. And that, that is one of these little green blobs running where we call that a VAT that contains you know, an event loop and a bunch of objects that are participating in a computation. And they can communicate asynchronously with each other. The reason I point out this layer is because I'm going to be talking about the consensus activity that is at these different layers. So there is the machine consensus block chain, whatever's going on at the consensus layer. But when we built our playground, we have a network protocol where VATTP, VAT transport protocol, is the data protocol for shuffling messages between VATs. And that's whether the VAT is running on a solo machine like my cell phone or my laptop or running in a public chain, you know, on an Ethereum or Tezos or, 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 or Polkadot or Cosmos, etc. Or, of course, Filecoin. Um, <laughs> So, and then above this, so now we have this, this, this generic engine, which is these VATs communicating asynchronously, but then we very specifically provide the language or one a language, and there could be more than one, that is the object-oriented programming language where you're able to write things and have object references that are references that are only asynchronously accessible, but there are on these other uh, green blobs, these other VATs that are running on other machines or other chains. And you can then asynchronously send, oh, that didn't, didn't animate as well here, but you can asynchronously Synchronously send, you can send asynchronous messages between these machines, have an object reference for the result of those messages, and build up large-scale computation. And so then we have a framework of reusable smart contract objects that we're building up above this layer that lets you plug and play with escrow agents and auctions and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be talking about these two middle layers because what we built is a playground VAT to be able to take 
contracts like that 2013 contract and build it and then start building up from there the reusable components while we retarget the platform underneath to various different blockchain infrastructures. And there, what we did is we, we built a version that was not about getting on the blockchain. It was about being able to immediately start building these contracts. Right? You know, Zuko said, if you're building a consensus layer, you need a testnet. If you're building a framework and environment, you need a playground to build it in. Right? OK, so um, rather than do the, the you know, integrate with any particular consensus layer, we built a toy version, which is interesting in that it has all the right properties and doesn't work at all the way you want to do to go to production. But it's interesting to be able to play with that sort of thing. So imagine each of these is a separate permissioned chain. And that's effectively what we implement, where you know, Alice is running on a solo machine, so she's just got her laptop and she wants to go buy something. Bob is running on a replicated execution of, of you know, a two out of three consensus VAT. So he's running a separate permission chain with, in this case, you know, three, th three circles. And his assertion is two of them have to say that you've bought it, in which case, you know, I, Bob, have signed off on it. So it's doing um, you know, message multi-sig, essentially. And then similarly, the contract host is, host is another permission chain that is running two out of three. Um, you know, the issuer of the token, the issuer of the assets, they're all running on their completely independent permission chain. And now this smart contract that's doing this escrow exchange is running across all these different chains. We just want it to be a sort of as expansive as possible. And the way that works is we have a, the, in the secure subset of JavaScript, we can run in a deterministic fashion. And so when the program is running, when the escrow agent, for example, is running on that center chain, it's going to receive a message and run the same program, computing the same state transition and the same messages out, which then all get sent. OK, so what's going on there? So um, conceptually, right, so this is looking at just Alice's VAT, or you know, well, one of the VATs. Let's say this is the contract host, but I'm calling it A here. And it's got messages coming in conceptually from the issuer B and Bob on C, right? So it's getting messages from these other VATs. Now remember, each of these other VATs is, is, a, is a multi, you know, uh, 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 has multiple presences as a chain. So you're going to get messages from different machines running the same B, different machines running the same C. So, so Alice is looking to make sure that when a message comes in from B, she knows that it actually was signed off by two out of the three B. So these are, and, and it's not that there's one Alice running that needs to do that. It's each of these three replicas of Alice need to do the same verification and get their own assurance that they actually saw Bob send that message, and then there'll be a quorum about this. Okay, actually, before we quite go there, let me go back to this. The other important thing here is for every message and contract state, it will deterministically compute the same state, right? The only source of non determinism here is that, you know, in the case of contract host, right, there is a, a, a rival order non determinism of the messages from Alice and Bob. And so there must be an agreement among all the replicas in the contract host as to what order it's going to take those messages. And once there's a recorded agreement of that, now we could totally throw away the contract host, replay everything from scratch, and get exactly the same state. And so what that means is this can be entirely persistent simply by remembering the messages as delivered and the, or the agreement, the quorum agreement about what order they were received in. Okay, and then we can, so now suddenly we've got persistence. Is it a blockchain? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But suddenly we have completely re reliable, replicable persistence of each of these independently. Additionally, that can be done on each of the replicas. So they can just fail, replay their messages, get back to the same start point, um, realize they have consensus, and keep moving forward. So, um, so each of these messages is going to be getting various messages, not just from B, but from each of the instances, each of the different machines in B, and each of the different machines in C. So the messages come in, and there's basically a scoreboard where, you know, on the, you know, in, these are messages to A. From B, it's getting, you know, it's got, a, it's got three of the same message five from A. It's got only one of message six from B. It's got one of message seven. So this is all figuring out 
what messages have I gotten in what order? How many of the, you know, have I got two out of three of the copies of that message from the different instances of, of, of B that are sending this message so that each one of these machines is verifying that it actually got um, a, a, a essentially multi-sig message from their correspondent VATS. So there's all no root of trust, sorry, no trust bottleneck. So a is sending messages to B where there is, you know, each instance of A sends to each instance of B so they can each individually verify what order they got, vote on it, and proceed ahead deterministically. Okay. So you're never going to want to deploy this in production, though, because, um, uh, so the reason we did this, for, first off, is because it's, this is, um, this particular implementation is connection oriented where we're using libp2p so that when an instance of a connects to an instance of b it does so over on over an authenticated connection so that b knows it got a message from from a.1 right and and then when the second instance of a connects to that same instance of b it can verify oh i got a, i got the same message from a.2 so i can record that and you end up with whatever it is n squared or exponential or some some horrible number of connections in order to have authenticated messages messages from enough of the A instances for, B, for each instance of B to go, yep, got it. And then each of those A's has to connect with B.2 and B.3 in order for all of them to agree. So there's, a, there's an explosion of connections. But it, lets, it let us do libp2p, it let us do all the right correct execution so that the JavaScript execution above has the, has the correct semantics. So. Where does that, you know, that's obviously, you know, that, that works just fine for permission networks. It works fine for small networks. It's exactly what you want for an individual machine sending messages into a blockchain, but it doesn't scale at all. What you want to do is convert to having the it be signed messages. So when A.1 sends a message, it signs it. Now that packet could be gossiped to the other A's. So any one of them could roll up a signature, send a single message that says, yeah, here's a quorum of A's. I've already agreed on this message. It can add it to any of the B's. And then the B's can gossip and say, did you see the A message, you know, number three? Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw it. And they, they so that, that suddenly dramatically takes you from, you know, the N squared messages to local gossip and then individual messages. So, and, and several systems have done that. The nice thing about this architecture is that is at the VATTP layer, the data packet layer. So we transition from libp2p to something like Cosmos' uh, IB, IBC, IBC, yes. And, um, and it's the same semantics at the layer of talking about object references, but a completely different approach and implementation for passing the, the, the data back and forth. And then the same kind of thing, you know, conceptually where, where there are multiple architectures for implementing the remote object security model that we require, which is called object capabilities. The one that our playground uses is called web keys. It's a well understood one, but it relies on secrets, right? In some sense, for me to have an object reference that, you know, like I've got a, I've got a file, and if I say read, because I have the file object, I can read the content. And if you don't have the file object, you can't read the content. I don't, I don't even know what file it's referring to. I don't have a name. I just have an object that lets me do a read. That maps to, in this, what we call the web keys model, that maps to, I've got a cryptographic key that, that I've got a secret that lets me sign messages that, 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 that the object at the other end will understand. Um, and you can't, you can do secrets inside of permission machines, inside of hosts, or inside of wallets or, 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 or single machines, but you can't do secrets on a public chain. So there is a different approach for, called the C-list approach, and it's a classic way to implement the object capability model that comes out of um, you know, lot, uh, a long history of secure operating systems that we will convert to. But again, the nice thing is it has exactly the same semantics, so the programming model above that is layered in the, in the same infrastructure. So I just wanted to, to use a few minutes to talk through what's the toy version doing, where does the real system go, because the nice thing is everything built works the same on both, but when, when some people start to pull down um, uh, the playground vat and build, and build on our system, they, in, they end up encountering this entirely different way, and you can look at it and go, and clearly, I would not go to production with that, and yet it can be swapped out uh, completely transparently. So thank you for your attention, and, and that's just a part of the playground that we built.